I am a woman, I am a neuroscientist, and I'm also a mother. And what I am here at this moment, it's the result of my genetics and of my experience. So as a neuroscientist, I study the brain, and I study how our brain represents the outside world and also how it represents our body. And through my body, I, I navigate the world, I have experiences, I interact with other beings, just like uh, humans have always done. So if we think a bit about our life experiences, during the last century, we have seen how many of the constraints have vanished. And for example, my grandmother never left our country. She probably hardly ever get out of our city, and I'm taking a plane to go to the other side of the world to attend a conference. Or uh, there are... Um, Changes like obviously in communication, so uh, we can have video conferences with anyone in the world, or some of you may be texting right now to people that are remotely located. So many of the constraints have vanished, but of course in our life experience, there are still many remaining constraints. So for example, there are the physical constraints, we cannot fly or we cannot walk on water, or how do I see the world? Well, I can only see the world through my own eyes, and I'm grounded to my body. So I have a body that eh, can, I can gain weight or lose weight or change clothes or get tattoos, but basically this is my vehicle in the world. So um, how do we escape? Can we escape this? Can we enhance our possibility for experiences? And this happens to us, for example, during dreams. So during dreams, we are free from all these physical constraints. We can fly or we can have, uh, transform our bodies. We can change identities. We are free, but however, we are hardly in control. And, uh, it's fleeting, we hardly remember it. So we are not in control, therefore our life experience is mostly grounded to our body, is limited by, by the physics, right? Uh, but this is not completely true, because nowadays we have this technology which can allow us to, to be completely free from physical constraints that can give us Different perspectives can transform our bodies, and this is a virtual reality. And this is what I'm going to be talking to you about. So, a few years ago, in, back in, in 2004, we started exploring how it was to give people a body in virtual reality. So, if you have tried virtual reality, your experience may have been that you look down and sometimes you don't have a body, or eventually you may have some arts moving with you. But we started exploring not only what is to, to have a virtual body, but we wanted to see how could we induce an illusion of ownership of this body, of embodiment in this body. And we saw that if there are appropriate uh, sensory motor correlations, if we can control this body, when our movements, or if we can feel what we touch in the virtual world, all these sensory motor and multisensory correlations are going to induce an illusion of embodiment, an illusion that this is indeed my body. And what we have observed in our laboratory in, during many years of experiments is that the virtual body that we have actually has an influence in us. So, what uh, happens to this body is going to affect us, or the aspect of this body is going to have consequences. And we can see this in physiological consequences, behavioral consequences, psychological, cognitive consequences. So let me just give you an example of physiological consequences. So for example, if I'm in virtual reality, I have a, a virtual body and there is a threat to this body, probably I'm going to have some stress response or heart rate increase or increase skin conductivity. Or, for example, 
we are going to respond in, in all different ways to what's going to, to happen to, to this virtual body. So it's very interesting because this, on the one hand, as scientists, it's good to have measures for this. So for example, uh, these consequences are like if, if uh, I can have the illusion that the, the position, the posture of my virtual body is actually my own position, even if it's not truth. So this is giving me a key on the one hand to quantify, because as scientists we want to quantify this impact of a virtual body, but on the other side, these realistic responses are going to be the key to applications. And therefore, this is why a virtual reality is being used for different therapies or for medical applications, because we respond realistically to what is happening there, even when we obviously know it's not real. We know it's created by a computer. So let me give you uh, an example. You enter in virtual reality, and you have the body of a child. So, for example, you look down, you see your small body, your roundish hands, you are surrounded by objects that look big to you, there are some toys around, you move, and this child body moves with you, you see yourself reflected in a mirror, and eventually a mother figure comes into the room, and to talk to her, you need to look up at her. So, Domna Banaku in our group, she did these studies, and she discovered that after having this child body, people had an overestimation that could be measured of objects. So the whole surroundings, as when we are a child, look bigger because they were in this childish body, all the subjects. So therefore, uh, there is a, a measure to this, and it's a very nice illustration of how flexible our brain is, that we change our body and we can perceive the world differently. And another interesting consequence from this, when it was uh, used in mothers, there was an increase of empathy of mothers towards their children. So this is uh, interesting, so we thought, well, what would happen if we give people, for example, a body of a different race? So, uh, Mele Slater and other people from our group, what uh, they did was to give Caucasian uh, users participating in the experiment darker bodies, and again, they moved in these bodies, they saw themselves reflected in a mirror, and even they attended in some experiments a Tai Chi class, that they did in this body with a darker skin. And what they have observed very consistently is that people have a decrease implicit racial bias after having these experiences. So, therefore, we have a, a very powerful tool in our hands that can make profound changes in people. And uh, how can we bring this to society? What can be a good use? So there is a whole area of applications um, in the medical realm, which are uh, very uh, important. Uh, like, for example, in, I've been very interested in pain, in pain, because we know that in virtual reality we can modulate uh, pain thresholds, and we have been uh, studying how it can be decreased pain in, in patients with with chronic pain, but today I'm going to tell you about a completely different application. And it's another world problem associated to violent behavior. And one form of violent behavior is violence against women. And uh, these are uh, numbers from the World Health Organization. One in three women in their lives they suffer uh, from domestic violence, or from violence from their intimate partner. And as you can see in that map, actually it's a problem that is, uh, ex exists all over the world with slight differences. So, could, could this kind of approach help to some extent to this problem? So, uh, violent behavior has been uh, associated to decreased levels of empathy. And I thought, well, to what extent 
if we can give a, a, an aggressor the embodied perspective of a victim, to what extent is this going to increase the empathy towards the victim? So we created uh, environments uh, where the following happens. Men go into a virtual environment and they have the body of a woman. They move around, they play some game, they get uh, familiar with this body, they have some kind of embodiment in this body, and then there is a situation where a man enters the scene, enters this apartment, and then there is a, a talk to this now woman, who is a, a man, a man user, and then there is this man that enters the scene, has a, a very demeaning words towards the woman, gets progressively closer, uh, there is some interaction, so if the person looks away, it says, look at me, or if the person speaks, says, shut up. And then it gets progressively closer and uh, complains that she talks too much on the phone, that some violent act breaks the phone and gets uh, really close. So we had this environment, and with, with the first uh, series of experiments, we thought, well, are people going to respond to this? Because, of course, they know this is not real. So we ran some studies in control men, non-violent men, and uh, they went through this experience. And actually, even when they knew this is not uh, real, they, they uh, reported um, being uh, intimidated by this virtual character. Uh, they reported uh, feeling some helplessness in this perspective of uh, the woman. And um, they indeed, their gender bias in an implicit gender bias test was decreased after the experience. They felt that this invasion of the peripersonal space felt as very aggressive. And, um, uh, and also the fact that this man was taller than them and they had to look up. So even when one knows, well, this is not real, but I had a response to them and we had different measures. So it's not only reporting, but we can quantify how people respond uh, behaviorally, physiologically, uh, and so on. So we thought, well, this may then work. So how can we use it with perpetrators of domestic violence? So some years ago, we started a collaboration with the Catalan Justice Department that they run the rehabilitation for perpetrators of uh, domestic violence. And then we started a collaboration. And since then, over 250 men have, had uh, used these environments in the rehabilitation. And uh, we have found that, in fact, it's, it's valuable in order to increase the empathy and we have been able to get somehow to the roots of it because we have been able to measure there is, for example, changes in emotion recognition that are often altered in people with violent behavior. So also we have got like interesting explicit reports from them. Like uh, I've been able to understand how my, my wife feels when I talk to her uh, like that. Or, for example, uh, to realize that, well, even if there is no physical violence, this, this is a, a very bad, a very painful situation, so it increases somehow the understanding. So when, when we can provide this uh, embodied perspective in virtual reality, there are an explicit realization of how it is to be in that position, how people can feel, but also we observe different implicit changes, like changes in emotion recognition, or changes in, in uh, gender bias, or changes in racial bias. So therefore, I think this can be a very useful tool in order to improve our empathy, our tolerance, or behavior towards the others. So uh, I started talking about experiences, and therefore, in virtual reality, we can have this uh, possibility of being completely free from, from physical constraints. We can be free even from our body. We can transform ourselves. 
And uh, therefore, I think it's, it can be a, a very powerful tool to enhance our range of experiences from different perspectives to enhance in this way our lives. Not only we can use it for entertainment, but we can also use it to learn, to increase our range of experiences. So uh, therefore, uh, as, as, a, as a mother, I think I can increase the empathy for, for my child. And as a woman, I, I would be very happy to contribute to some extent uh, to, to solve this problem of domestic violence and violence against women in general. And as a neuroscientist, I really believe that this is a very powerful tool to study the brain. Thank you.